Okay, everybody. So now that we've covered the migration period in broad strokes, and we've talked about Christianity and a couple other things, um, what we're going to be doing in the next chunk of this series is we're going to be talking more about the individual um, you know, groups of people that move into the Roman Empire. And we're also going to be taking a look at the Roman Empire itself, both in the historiography of the subject and uh, on the empire more generally on the eve of the migration period. But for this video, I want to talk about the Goths uh, and a little bit about the Huns. But to do that, we got to talk about the historiography of the subject. So the main ways of understanding the evidence available for the Goths and really the barbarian migrations in general uh, are threefold. So we have the Toronto School of History, the Vienna School, and the Oxford School. So all of these, all three of these are based around universities and scholars based in universities and colleges in three different cities, Toronto, Vienna, and Oxford. And all three disagree about the precise nature uh, of barbarian identity and the impact of the migration and the invasions and the impact that it had on the Roman Empire. Okay, so the Vienna School of Historiography, the key historians are, you know, you can see on the screen, uh, Venskis, Pohl, and uh, Wolfram. The main argument that the Vienna School is making, okay, is that well, a lot of the primary sources, not, not all of them, but a lot of them were written uh, with the Interpretatio Romana in mind. So this is the Roman interpretation. What it means is that the Romans had a very specific way of viewing the world. So when you're talking about the barbarians, from the Roman perspective, well, the barbarian tribes, the actual names and stuff might change, but they don't really change that much because regardless of whether someone is a Scythian or a Frank or whatever, you're still a barbarian. You're still a filthy, dirty brute. Um, so because of that, Roman sources are somewhat questionable in the information they give about these different groups and both those sources and the sources written by the barbarians themselves to help justify, uh, you know, takeovers, and kingship, stuff like that, a lot of what these sources state and a lot of what they do is they construct these grand kinship groups, dynasties, basically, um, in order to help grant legitimacy to the newcomers after the Western Roman Empire collapses. Because of that, because a lot of them are being written with a very specific aim in mind, yeah, there are some kernels of truth in them, but we have to take them for what they are, which a lot of them are propaganda pieces. So because of that, the primary sources are at best, you know, sketchy. Um, the reality is that these grand kinship groups probably were not the case. Although rulers thought they were related. And that's that really, according to the Vienna School, this is the key point here, that people thought they were related. And because of that, the barbarians had little or no solid ethnic identity. The ethnic identity, this idea of you're a Goth, you're a Hun, you're a Frank, you're, you know, insert tribe name here, comes after people move into the Roman Empire. So that's the main argument of the Vienna School. The Toronto School takes a more extreme approach. Uh, the, the primary sources are basically totally worthless. Many are made, like I said, to glorify barbarian kingdoms, and thus they don't reflect actual oral tradition. Um, so we can't use them at all. So the Vienna School argues that, yeah, okay, maybe maybe ethnic identity and stuff developed as people moved into the Roman Empire, but there still probably was a core around which people constructed those identities. The Toronto School totally rejects that and sees barbarian groups moving into the Roman Empire as kind of this like amorphous mass, and they also don't necessarily view migrations as being all that large. Uh, a lot of people have problems with this. In some ways, the Toronto School is an overreaction to Nazi ideology and the ways that culture history was used in the 20th century to justify ethnic cleansing and the construction of state. So it, it, a lot of people have issues with this. And the key issue, the, the key group that has issues with this is the Oxford School. So probably the key historian for the Oxford School uh, is a fairly popular historian as far as books go, um, and that is Peter Heather. So the main argument Peter Heather has, and to a degree, this is like uh, an overreaction to the Toronto School's overreaction, is that 
barbarian groups had a stable ethnic identity, or a fairly stable ethnic identity. Uh, there was an intense reliance on archaeogenetics to back up migration. But the problem with doing that is that for this period, different groups gain and lose a lot of people pretty quickly. So even if there is genetic differences, even if there are genetic differences in the actual archaeology that we find, uh, we have two problems. One is that that doesn't necessarily indicate that ethnic identity was stable. It also does not necessarily indicate that ethnic identity was highly fluid. Um, as we're going to see, this is, there are issues with this. But the other problem is that a lot of historians probably do not understand genetics and biology as well as they think they do. And I will be the first one to admit that I don't. I'm not a scientist. Um, so there are going to be issues with using data like that, especially if you're trying to react against a different interpretation. So going along with all of this, the Oxford School argues that the migrations were largely triggered by the Huns. This has serious problems, and we will talk about that in more detail when we get to the Hunnic migrations. But for now, I want to focus on the Goths. On this map here, the purple is the Roman Empire. Uh, green, pink, you can read those on the, you know, legend I have. Those are like Gotland and land of the Goths. Uh, what we're concerned with here is the orange and red. So the orange is the uh, Santana de Mures Chernikov culture, and the red is the uh, Vilbar culture. So the first official mention we really have of the Goths in Roman sources is in about 251. In 251, we have some early references to people called the Goths. Um, Emperor Decius leads troops against them. He's killed fighting against the Goths. And by 300, the Goths are a major force north of the Danube. So the problem is, you know, the question is, well, where did these people come from? And we have two theories. We have, native we have native development, and we have migration. So the main source that argues for migration is this textual source, the, the uh, Jetica, or Getica, depending on how you want to pronounce it. This is the origin and deeds of the Goths, and this is written by a guy named Jordanius. So this has problems. So Jordanius is using an older history of the Goths, which has not survived now, as part of his basis for constructing this narrative. However, it's written in about 550, well after the Goths have moved into the Roman Empire and set up their own Ostrogothic kingdom in what is today basically Italy and uh, the Adriatic coast of the Balkans. So, it's written as propaganda to help beef up the ruling Amal dynasty of the Ostrogoths, and the way that Jordanius does that as he says, oh, well, we have this glorious history of migration from up north, this place, uh, Gothoscanza, which is today probably like the, the Baltic coast of like Poland and Sweden, like that area. We moved south from there. And it's like, okay, yeah, you could, you could believe that. There's nothing inherently wrong about taking that as a fact. The problem, though, is that the origins and deeds of the Goths in order to help establish this, like, glorious, legitimate dynasty, places the Goths all over history. So he says they fought with the pharaohs in Egypt and, like, all this other stuff. So, like, he's clearly fabricating some stuff. Um, so the problem then becomes, well, how do we, how do we shift? How do we, you know, figure out, okay, here's the text. Here's the facts. And here's what's fabricated. It's really hard to do that. So a lot of people, because of this, have had issues with the whole migration idea. Now, there are numerous places in Sweden um, that look like they come from the Gothic language. The general consensus among historical linguists and uh, philologists is that the Gothic language is probably, probably from southern Sweden. But Gothic identity, this idea that I am a Goth, is probably not. In Sweden, in the surrounding area, 
Goatland and Gotland, all these different areas that look like they're, you know, related to Goths or have a, 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 root, a root word of Goth or Gothic, are probably related uh, to the Geats, not the Goths themselves, who may be related to that group. It's it's not really clear because the Roman primary sources that talk about these groups are just going off of, like you say, like n none of these people ever went to the Baltic Sea coast, so we're just going off like what's in Roman sources. Um, so this suggests two things. It suggests that one, Gothic identity was probably something of a fluid construct, but it also suggests that the Gothic language spread south from Sweden and from the Baltic coast, which suggests also migration. Um, so how do we read this stuff? And we're gonna we're gonna talk more about this in the next video, but just to get ourselves set up. In Poland, this red line we see on the map, this is the uh Vilbark culture. And you can see it kind of extends from the Baltic coast of Poland down into what is today like Romania. So this culture, this archaeological culture, is on top of another series of archaeological sites. Uh, that is the uh, Presverse culture. So that culture lasts between about the 3rd century BCE and the 5th century BCE. It is largely situated in central Poland. It's usually associated with the Vandals, sometimes with the early Slavs, although there are problems with that, uh, mainly because the evidence is sparse. But the Vilbar culture starts showing up in the same region around the 1st century CE, and eventually it does supersede the original culture uh, over about a 200-year period. Okay, sure, this happens all the time. We see this quite a lot in the archaeological record. The thing that people who favor migration look at, though, is the fact that, well, that red line, that band of uh, Vilbar culture, extends down into the Santander de Mures Chernikov culture, which is orange. So this is where the uh, Goths typically are found in Greco-Roman sources. The archaeology there is very strongly associated with the Goths, so we know that's where they were. Um, but the Vilbar culture extends down into the Santander de Mures Chernikov zone. So if the Goths migrated well, then we, we have the archaeological evidence to prove it. Um, it's problematic. We're going to talk about this more in the next, in the next video. But, you know, as this is moving... A series of wars and military campaigns are set off called the Marcomonic Wars. So, my point is that it's very easy to just read this as oh, well, the Goths are migrating from southern Sweden, from northern Poland, but there's also a whole lot of population shifts going on in this period. So, where the Goths come from, um, we're going to get into more detail with in the next video. As we're going to see, it's probably a combination of migration and in situ development, but I'm just using this video to set the stage. So this is the first video in, you know, all of the barbarian peoples that I have planned for this series on medieval warfare, both how they come into being and how they fought. So in the next video, we'll keep going, and I will see you all next time.